thank you. Um, good morning. My talks, as always, are on talks.php.net, f 15 for this one. Twitter, at Rasmus. Hold on. Vous avez toujours été au cœur du monde de PHP. Et maintenant, nos cœurs sont avec vous. It's been a very emotional time for me, and anyone who knows me knows I'm not a very emotional person. Um, but it's been a special time for PHP, and I'm very, very happy to be in Paris for this, this special time for us and for you. All right, I'll try to cheer up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> PHP 7, you already know, it's fast. It uses a lot less memory. If you saw Zev's and Nikita's talks, you know why and, and how. There are a couple of other interesting features um, when it comes to deploying PHP. One of my favorites is a file-based opcache. So hopefully you all know we have this shared memory opcode cache that sits between the parser and the executor that, par that um, caches the opcodes and shared memory. Now we also, as a PHP 7, have a file-based backup for that. Or it doesn't have to be a backup. It could also be the only cache um, for CLI scripts, for example. And testing on various scripts, if index.php uncached is 1x time, grabbing it from shared memory and executing is about 10x time, or 10 times as fast. Um, reading off a disk, index.php.bin, the, the parsed cached version on, on disk, is about 4x, so four times faster. Um, and that, <clears throat> one of the places you could use it is from straight CLI. So Composer is a very popular CLI script, right? And if you turn on the file-based opcache, which you can do in your PHP CLI.ini, so you just have it for CLI, then you can see here in about, the first time you run it, when it has to cache, it takes about 40 milliseconds to run, and then subsequent runs or 19 milliseconds. Compared to uncached, it's about 33 milliseconds every time you run it. Now, it's not a major thing, obviously, but some companies, some sites have lots of cron jobs and lots of stuff, and this is a very easy way of doubling your performance of all your CLI scripts. So I think it's a handy little trick. And there's also other uses for it, which I'll cover in a bit. If you look at it, many people don't know Many people think Composer is like a, a single file PHP script, right? It isn't. It's a FAR file, PHP archive, and inside that FAR file, you have all this stuff, um, which you can see if you go to your file-based upcache directory that you configured, you'll see every individual .bin file cached separately in there. Other new features, AST. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because you probably heard them in other talks. I, I like the AST as well. It, allows all kinds of interesting tools to be built. Exceptions and fatals. Most fatals now are actually exceptions. Um, and with that, you get a stack trace, which can be handy. You can catch them if you want. In order to not break older scripts that had some kind of catch-alls, we have a separate exception hierarchy now, or we have a, we've split up the exception hierarchy. Everything, um, implements the throwable interface, <clears throat> but we have this sister class to exception now called error. So these new fatals are either a type error or a parse error. So you can catch those separately. You can still build a catch-all for everything if you really want to. Seems like a bad idea, but you could catch throwable if you like. Return types, I think that's been covered well. Cursive and scalar. Of course, of scalar typing and strict scalar typing, you can switch back and forth. Um, with cursor, cursive types, if you specify types, you are guaranteed to have these types inside your scripts. You don't need to cast things. And standard PHP coercion rules apply with notices for stuff like non-well formed. If you pass in 2.5 bananas to an int, it's gonna tell you that it's not a well formed int. Or you can go crazy and go all strict all the time and then it'll complain on every little thing if you don't have exact types. <clears throat> Anonymous classes, 
like anonymous functions. There was a whole talk yesterday just on anonymous classes I saw, which was interesting. The null, null coalesce operator, basically you can chain things together. This one will not throw a warning on undefined things. So it's a way of getting rid of boilerplate is set types of checks. So the first non-null set um, variable will be returned. So A or B, um, A is null, B is zero, so you get zero back. C or B, C is two, B is zero, so you're gonna get two back, right? And you can chain them together, if you like. And you won't, here, X is not defined at all. You don't get a notice. You simply get two back, because C is two, right? Spaceship operator to help fix people who write unstable comparison functions for user sorts. Um, this will make sure you get it right. If A is less than B, negative one, right? A equals B, it's zero. B is greater than A, you get the one back. Uh, my son tells me it's actually the Thai advanced X1, it's the spaceship. Um, people have incorrectly been calling it the Thai bomber or even the Thai fighter, which is nowhere close, according to him. Zero cost assertions, another favorite feature of mine. You can litter your code with thousands of assertions if you want. And in your INI file for your production config, you can set it to minus one, which means that the opcodes will actually get stripped out. Um, so it is zero cost completely. You can have 10,000 asserts in your code. It will not affect performance in any way whatsoever in production. And you can then turn them on just for your dev servers. Closure call, shortcut to binding closures to, to classes. And we've removed all kinds of PHP 4 stuff. All the things that PHP 5 has been warning you about for about 12, 13, 14 years, whatever it is, um, most of those are now gone. So if you have PHP 4 code, it'll probably break. A Bunch of new reserved words. If you have a string class, it won't work. Fix it. 64-bit stuff has been cleaned up. All kinds of edge cases have been fixed. Octals now generate a parse error. Um, previously in PHP 5, this would just set mask to zero with no notice or anything. You wouldn't really know that you made a mistake. Now in PHP 7, it will give you a parse error. It won't even parse the file. Uniform variable syntax. This is probably the trickiest, trickiest backward compatibility thing that you might hit moving from PHP 5 to PHP 7. It was necessary to do to clean up all kinds of weird inconsistencies in parsing long complex expressions in order to get the AST to be sane and not to be a huge mess full of, full of exceptions. Um, and it's not that bad. I'll we'll talk more about that in a bit. A new Yundu code, code point, escape syntax slash u, you put the code point in, a new Intel char class. We have a new cryptographically safe um, random number generator. You could do this before via OpenSSL and others. Now it's a very simple thing, random int, min, max, or just give me 10 random bytes. You'll get the binary bytes back, so you then have to somehow convert them either with unpack or bin to hex. Um, on Linux, this will generally use the get random syscall which uses entropy and stuff. Otherwise, on, if there's no get random, if you're not on Linux or an older Linux, then it'll use dev u random. And I think we have finally come to um, the decision that we're gonna release December 3rd now. So look forward to that next week. As I've covered this well yesterday, um, but I want to mention it as well because it is almost magic the fact that you can take a 20 year old code base and double or sometimes triple the speed of it. Um, if you just look at the instructions, like was mentioned yesterday, January 2014 at 9.4 billion instructions to serve up 100 uh, front pages of WordPress, 9.4 billion instructions. By the end of the year, it was down to 2.9 billion instructions. So it's basically taking up big piece of legacy code and removing two thirds of all the instructions. So you only have one out of three lines left essentially without breaking anything. That is not an easy task. And these three guys, Dimitri, Chen Chen and Nikita have done an absolutely amazing job on that. Um, very, very close to magic as far as I'm concerned.
I, didn't, I did not think that could be done. Um, I think they were a little bit surprised as well. Um, I, I find it super amazing, thanks to those guys. Um, this was covered pretty well of how, in Nikita's talk, of how it was actually done by shrinking lots of the different structs um, and adding a whole bunch of optimizations. I especially like the immutable array optimization, right? In my own little tests, this program here that does 100,000 um, arrays, so I'm appending this array inside, so we have a set of nested arrays. In PHP 5, that takes 109 megabytes. PHP 7, with opcache turned off, it takes 42 megabytes. Then you turn on opcache, and it can store these immutable arrays. It just stores it once, basically, and then refers to it. Um, then we're down to six megs. So we went from 109 megabytes of memory down to six for exactly the same code. Essentially, it doesn't use memory anymore to do this, right? Which is pretty amazing. And we'll look at the real world effects of that in a bit, and all kinds of other optimizations to get to where we are. Another somewhat tricky one is we now support huge pages. And this is something you have to specifically configure on your servers if you want it to, to do this. You have to build PHP with huge page support, but then you also have to configure your server. This is not using THP, which is transparent huge pages. This is explicit huge pages in that you configure your server to say, I want this many huge pages, and then you tell up cache to go and use them. And you will see, once you start up PHP, you will see that it will serve a bunch of your huge pages. This is how you know that it's working. If you don't see that, then you mess something up along the way. And you'll get, depending on, on conditions, you'll get two, three, four percent speed up by doing this. More speed ups. I still think we can get more um, out of this because it's just the, the base of PHP that has been made super, super fast. We still have the opportunity to add a JIT for hotspots. Um, We'll, we'll, I think we have to resurrect Dimitri's JIT and, and see what it can do on hotspots and how we can maybe massage it a little bit. But I think the combination of the two, I think, can be interesting. Um, but that's for, for the next couple of years to play with. Anyway, so what does this all do to the real world? What does this do to your applications? Please don't trust my benchmarks. Do your own. Benchmark your own code. Other people's benchmarks are close to useless. But these are mine, I'm gonna show you them anyway. All the specs for these benchmarks are here. You can try to recreate them. All the configurations, you can go through those. So first, Drupal 8, which was just released, runs really, really well on PHP 7. Um, you can see versus PHP 5, PHP 6, and HHVM 3.10. It's pretty much a dead heat between HHVM and PHP 7 on, on this particular one. This is on 20 concurrent requests. If you drop down to 10 concurrent requests, PHP 7 does a little bit better than HHVM in that case. If you go up to 40 concurrent requests, the picture looks pretty much the same. Um, on the latency side, at 10 and 20, on latency, lower is obviously better, right? So we have PHP 5 at 7.5 milliseconds latency and 14.7 at 20 requests, right? So we've dropped quite a bit on it. It's not gonna be dropped in half on this one, but it, it's, it's still significant. WordPress, WordPress is everyone's favorite guinea pig. So it always looks very impressive um, because this is what we're benchmarking against. So here we have PHP 7 on WordPress. HHVM is slightly faster, which is a bit annoying actually. So um, I had a look at what FTO would do to WordPress. FDO is feedback directed optimization. Um, I think it was Nikita that mentioned that yesterday. Someone mentioned that yesterday. Um, but this is how you actually do it. So you can go into PHP, make clean, and then build a profiling binary by doing prof gen, make prof gen. Then you can run it through PHP CGI minus T, which repeats request however many times you want. So here I'm just hitting the front page of WordPress a thousand times. Then I go back to my PHP source directory, prof clean, and prof use. So that rebuilds the binary to use the profiling information that is specific to WordPress um, and builds a new binary that will run WordPress well. And the result, 
right? So PHP, PHP 7 without tuning it for WordPress. And you can see it's not a huge jump, 627 to 658. Percentage-wise, it's not a huge jump. But it did let us sneak ahead of HHVM on, on WordPress in this particular instance. So it's a bit of a hack, but if you are a single app shop that you just run one thing all the time, there's no reason not to tune your PHP for that particular app. If you're an ISP that runs everything, no, don't do it. There's no point, because it will slow down other use cases a little bit. Right, um, so, okay, other applications, PHP BB, and here you can see going from PHP 5.3. If you're still stuck on PHP 5.3 and you're a PHP BB site, and I know there are a lot of sites like this out there, there are a lot of old forum sites running PHP BB, probably on PHP 5.3. When they upgrade to PHP 7, they're gonna get almost 3x performance out of this thing, right? Which is pretty incredible. Uh, MediaWiki, PHP or HHVM has tuned quite a bit for MediaWiki, so we're a little bit behind there, but it's still a 2x. If you're running MediaWiki on PHP 5, you're gonna get 2x performance, and your latency is gonna drop by a ton. So your latency from PHP 5.3 of 170 milliseconds is gonna drop down to 72, right? Massive, massive drop. OpenCart. Here we can't do much because it spends all its time in the, in the database. Um, nothing we do in PHP is gonna speed up your crappy MySQL queries, right? Sorry. Wardrobe, I picked this one because it's a standard Laravel application. So if you have modern PHP um, standards and you're using Laravel, Symfony, things like that, this is what you can expect out of PHP 7. More than double performance over PHP 5.6 even. Geeklog, another random blogging platform I downloaded. Here, we're not getting 2x out of it. It might be spending a bit more time in the database than other things. Magento 2, also, was it just released? So it's about to be released, I don't remember. Um, but Magento 2 under PHP 7 runs really, really well. HHVM is struggling a bit on, on Magento 2 for some reason, don't know why. Track, it's a Bug tracking application, again, runs super, super well under PHP 7. Cache, it's a status for like, when, if your site's down, you can run a, a cache page on an AWS instance and that can be your status application. This runs extremely well too, more than double performance. Moodle, it's an educational management thing that manages, like my son's school uses it to manage classes and homework and stuff, more than double performance. Zencart, another shopping application that spends a lot of time in the database. And here you can see PHP 5, even though we made big, big improvements between PHP 5.3 and 5.4, it made no difference on Zencart. Again, because it's spending a lot of time in the database. We did finally move the needle in PHP 7, nowhere close to double, but I think by reducing memory usage by a lot, all these SQL queries that are probably bringing back huge chunks of stuff we could now fit these into arrays that take less memory and we can move that around faster. So I think that's why, where we finally got the boost from it, even though it was very stubborn across those other versions. And actually measuring real world memory use, I mean, you can do a get memory usage inside PHP and get some idea of your PHP script, but what you really care about is how much actual memory does it take away from your system how many concurrent PHP FPM processes or Apache processes can you run um, with PHP 7? And can you now, when you upgrade to PHP 7, can you now increase the concurrency? Can you go from 50 requests, 50 uh, concurrent requests to 100? Um, can you essentially like turn off half your servers in your data center? And to measure that, you need to look at, I, you can use tools like PS, but it doesn't really tell you much because RSS is confusing. Um, virtual size is confusing because it includes all the shared pages as well, and each one does not take this much memory. It doesn't take this much memory, so it's really hard to reason about memory usage in Linux because so much of it is shared among multiple processes. I find the best tool to measure it is SMEM. SMEM has this idea of proportional set size, and it distributes 
proportionally the shared pages across all the, the processes that are sharing them. So the PSS column here to me is the best estimation of what one PHP FPM process is using. Um, so here are 621 and I have 10 of them running. So it's about 6.1 megabytes to run 10 FPM processes. If I increase that to 20, the shared pages would be spread a little bit more so the memory usage would go down a little bit. So the incremental use goes down the more processes you run, but this is a good indication of, of, of how much memory each one uses because this is way over and this is way under. Um, so this is what I'm graphing on the next couple of pages. This is without any load. When I then start serving Drupal 8 pages off of it, it jumps up to 12.9 megabytes. So if we look at memory usage for various things, this is the base before putting any requests through PHP, which doesn't mean much, you don't care about that. But this is the startup usage, which is a little lower in PHP 7 than other versions. Then for Drupal 8, PHP 5.4 took 33 megabytes for 10 processes running. PHP 5.5 went to 45, so we, we actually started using more memory in PHP 5.5, dropped a bit in 5.6, but then you can see PHP 5.7 dropped from 42 down to 13 megabytes of memory, which is where you're getting all this speed from. We're moving a m much, much less memory around on every request. WordPress basically doesn't need any memory. It's magic, right? It has dropped from 94 megs down to 15 megs. It's just insanely efficient now in PHP 7. PHP BD, BB, here we didn't get that much because again, I think it's doing a lot of SQL queries and you have big long strings and stuff, big forum posts. So um, for some reason here, and that's why you need to measure on your own system as well. If you're not running WordPress and if you're running your custom code that's putting big chunks of data in memory, maybe you won't get these kind of results. But for most of the things I checked, it's crazy, crazy efficient. And one reason that these numbers are so low is that I'm not counting the opcache memory here. And a lot of the um, intern strings and the immutable arrays and things like that are just put once in opcache and zero times in the, in the process memory and it's just referencing them from shared memory. So that's why this looks like magic because this doesn't look possible. It doesn't look possible that you go from 147 megs to 19, right? That just looks ridiculous. Um, and, but it, it's cheating a little bit in the fact that it's using opcache, but that doesn't count against each incremental process. So it means that your concurrency can grow by a ton if you're a Moodle site without increasing the amount of memory in your machines. Wardrobe, which is Laravel application, again, 67 down to 22 megabytes of memory. All right. so. Hopefully I've convinced you that you should be running home. As soon as we release this next week, you should be running home and testing your stuff on PHP 7 and getting ready to push it into production, I don't know, by, by January 1 or something, right? Maybe January 2nd when you're less hungover. Um, full list, please, please, before you do this, read the migration document, php.net migration 7.0. I'll cover the top three things that I think will hit you when you take your PHP 5 code and try to make it work on PHP 7. And the first thing really is this um, uniform variable syntax, the left to right stuff, that everything is now parsed left to right. So whereas previously, something like dollar dollar foo bar bass, PHP 5 would actually expand this part first and, and get the v value of that and then that would be the name of the variable. In PHP 7, we're always going left to right. So we're gonna expand this and get the, that, then we're gonna expand this part and then this part, right? So we're always going left to right. You can obviously get the old behavior simply by adding curly braces. If you wanted to parse this part first, put curly braces around it. But this is the trickiest bit. There are ways of figuring it out. So I've hacked up a little static analyzer that can detect these patterns. Um, if you have unit tests, hopefully you have unit tests, they should fail and stuff like this and you can fix it. Um, it's important to note though that in all these, I installed all these applications to do my benchmarking and out of all of them, there was one that had that issue and it was track. 
And it had this particular line of code where they had this model and then um, as a belongs to model, but they also used this belongs to column. So they had a local variable called belongs to or a local array called belongs to, and they're then using that they're indexing that, getting the column, and using that as the name of the property that they want to access, which is kind of a weird thing to do. But regardless, the application broke, and the only thing I had to do to fix it to work on PHP 7 was to add curly braces here. But out of those 12 applications that I randomly checked, this was the only one that had a PHP 7 compatibility issue, and I had a pull request, and it's fixed now. Um, obviously, so it does not take a lot for developers to fix their applications. Most things will work. By the time PHP 7 is released next week, I think pretty much everyone will have fixed their compatibility issues on, on public applications like that. All right, so ah, the next one that might bite you is the fact that we removed the slash E, the eval option on PREG calls. Um, my presentation that's running this thing, I actually had, was using this. Um, I have these magic tags, because I tend to repeat myself. I do a lot of talks, and I repeat my slides in, in multiple conferences. And I have this magical syntax, this colon, dash, colon, city, or location, and colon, dash, colon. And that just replaces whatever city I'm speaking in will then show up in that slide as if I actually care about the city and customized it, right? Um, and this was very cool and nice to do. This pres slash slash one just grabs it, the, the name of the city out of this object. Now, this doesn't work in PHP 7 anymore. You have to use prec replace callback, and it's not that hard. You just pass it a, a closure and do the same thing. The syntax is a little longer, but essentially you just you pass in the matches, you get the, an array of matches, and here I'm taking the first match, like I do here, this means the first match, this is the first match, but be careful, right? Because of the left to right syntax, you wanna make sure that you actually, this is the name of the match, this is the name of the property that I want out of this object, so you have to put curly braces around it, which I didn't do initially, so I, I messed it up. Um, but my, my static analyzer caught it for me, which I'll show you in a second. And the last one that might hit you, and this one is actually, this isn't really a problem. This is fixing a bug in your code. I ran, when I first ran P, all of Etsy on PHP 7, we had a bunch of pages that didn't parse because of this. So we had these tables of, I think it was zip codes or something, and they were not in quoted strings, they were just zero, whatever, because some zip codes start with a zero, and they actually didn't work at all, so the code was broken. And it's, it was pretty crappy in PHP 5 that we did it that way because something like this, 05678, that outputs 375. Which you look at this going, uh, even if you convert, try to convert the octals, like how the heck did we get 375 out of that, right? And what happens is that PHP simply stops parsing. It goes zero, okay, we know it's an octal. So now we have octal number five, okay, six, 56 an octal, five, six, seven an octal, okay. And oops, we hit an eight, that's not octal, so we'll just ignore it. And we're gonna convert octal five, six, seven, which is 375 in decimal. So that's how PHP five works, which ah, is probably not what you want, right? It's definitely not what you meant when you wrote this. So now, in PHP 7, it just doesn't parse. It tells you, this is wrong. I don't know what this means. And it's really easy to detect. Just run PHP minus L, just do a lint. PHP minus L star, right? And it'll catch anything like that. All right, so um, static analysis. This is my hack for static analysis. Um, you can find it on GitHub called fan. Um, it's in the middle of a full rewrite at the moment. It works fine, the one you can grab there, but in a couple of weeks, there, there should be a new version that's completely rewritten that is less Rasmus code and more sort of modern PHP. Um, anyone who's read my code knows what I mean with, with Rasmus code. It's, I'm a terrible programmer, um, which doesn't actually matter if you just program the right things at the right time, as you can tell. Um, all right, so fan can do these things. Um, a bunch of different flags on it. One of them minus B 
checks for potential PHP 5 to PHP 7 BC issues. So it looks for those patterns of left to right things that will, prob that will not work the same in PHP 7. Once you've converted everything over, then you don't run the minus B flag anymore because it would still trigger on them and say this might not work the same. But if you know it's PHP 5 code, run minus B on your stuff and it'll try to find places where you might have issues. And you can also just pass all of your, your code through it. I generally do make a file list, like find all my PHP files, and I usually skip all the unit tests, put those in a text file, and then feed it that text file with minus F. So this is the file name of a text file containing all the files that you want to scan. And the output, um, here I'm scanning one file, just for, for the minus B stuff. And it came back and said, compat error. So this was in my presentation. And it came back and said, oops, this is probably not going to work. Right? And said, this is not PHP 7 compatible. And it found that mistake that I had made. <clears throat> Running it on something like Jordy's monologue, it comes up and finds a couple of places that might be compat errors. It does have some false positives on this. Um, I think these three were actually false positives. It's more about identifying places that may not work. It's not completely accurate that it won't work. And then it has other things. Jordy has a bunch of PHP doc types defined in his code that doesn't match the actual code. If Jordy's in the room, you should fix it. He's probably not, he's probably sleeping. Um, but anyway, this is the type of output that you can expect from it, basically going through and finding places where the types don't match. And it'll both look at PHP doc style types and PHP 7 types once you've added those and make sure that, that the types match what you're doing if you're returning the wrong type. Of course, PHP 7 will give you an error at runtime, but having static analysis that can scan all your code and find these before you might hit this problem in, a, in production is, is nice. This is a bit of a hack, this fan. I'll be the first to admit that. Even with the rewrite, it's a bit of a hack. But I wanted, to, I wanted a proof of concept to see how hard is it to use this new AST feature in PHP 7 to write a static, analysis, static analyzer. And it's not hard at all, because that job of writing a perfect AST is the first three months of, of writing a static analysis tool for PHP. That's now been erased, and you can just start on the fun stuff, which is walking the tree and doing interesting things with the, with the abstract tree. So if you're interested in static, anal static analyzers, please write one for PHP. We need all the static analyzers we can get. All right, deploying it. This is something almost every company I have visited gets wrong. And it's not that hard. But for some reason, there's this mental block against deploying code correctly to production servers. So, you want to make sure your stuff is atomic. You can't, like, you can't overwrite files in your, in your document root. Your production document root that's serving files currently, you can't just start overwriting stuff in that directory. Even if you use rsync and each file is replaced atomically, there are interactions between files, so you can't just do that. You also can't just flip a symlink. Um, something like Capistrano, for example, will just flip the symlink even while requests are being served. So halfway through a request, your document root or your symlink changes and your document root changes, which means that if you're in a set of includes and you're running some code and then suddenly that include file is from the new version that doesn't match the code that's already loaded, things will break on that request. Only for a fraction of a second, obviously, but you're still going to break a number of requests. And on busy sites, that could be hundreds of requests. And it could be in the, in the middle of a checkout and paying with their visa card and stuff and poof, things blow up. That's just not how we do things anymore. So don't do that. Don't just use Capistrano. Don't just use your own thing that just copies stuff into the document root. It doesn't work. So you want to do it without restarting anything, without clearing any caches to avoid thundering herds. So you want to always reuse your caches. And there's just one little trick that you need to know that solves all your problems. So if you have a web server, with a symlink, you set, your document root is set to, to a, a symlink that points to A, and you then flip it to B. You get, you're going to have requests that are currently underway. And at this point, you flip the symlink. So now, the symlink points to B, and you start serving requests out of B, while requests on A are still running. 
So you have to be able to have two versions of your site running concurrently for this to work. And the way it works is that you just have to make sure that all requests that start on A, if it starts on A, it has to finish on A. If it starts on B, it has to finish on B, no matter how much you flip your symlink back and forth. And the simple trick to do that is just to set the document route to the target of the symlink in the web server before PHP starts. So PHP does not know about that symlink at all. The web server simply tells PHP, your document route is A, go. And even if in the middle of the request that symlink changes to B, those requests that are on their way have no idea that new requests are going to get B as their document route, and they don't care. They're happily running on A at this point. With Nginx, this is trivial. They have that feature built in. You can set your document route to real path route, which will do the real path and figure out the target of the symlink at that point, and then set the document route to that. In Apache, there's no such feature. So I wrote a module called mod real doc that does this. You can grab it off GitHub. Obviously, for this to work, you have to avoid hard coding full paths. You want to make everything relative to your document route. Um, if you have hard coded paths in your include path, you want to make sure that you make those relative as well. Or there's an, there's an extension for PHP that can do that same replacement uh, and setting your include path at the beginning of the request to the target of the symlink, and it's called ink path. And it's PHP 7 compatible. You can grab it from GitHub. And obviously, static assets, you need to version them. Um, and this does not solve the case of database schema changes or any shared assets outside of web server PHP world. So and at Etsy, we manage deploys via IRC. Um, it's, we have this whole syntax of how you join a, a push queue and, and how you specify my code has been committed, um, has been pushed. Everything looks good, uh-oh, if things looks bad, and there's a push bot that manages all that. And we have this thing called Deployinator where you can just do a push a single button to send all your stuff to the, the testing servers, and then when everything looks good, everyone has said dot good in the RSC channel, you say deploy to production, Oof, everything goes to production. And this is the, the type of conversation or the type of interaction between the various, between Jenkins, push button, dev bot that you might see and you, you can look at those slides offline to, to see a standard Etsy push. Um, so you, the deploy nader will do an SSH to the deploy host, which does a D shell to all the targets and R syncs the files to the B document route. Then we do the whole flip the sim link um, atomically and everything gets pushed out and it comes back and tells you um, all your, your code is taking production traffic, it's time to check the graphs, blah, 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 and you say clear, and the next group of developers can then jump into the push queue and go through this whole dance uh, of pushing new code out. It's, it's a pretty interesting way of, of doing things. Graph everything, StatsD, Ganglia, Graphite, log everything, we use ELK, um, we have our own tools we've written as well, Logster, SuperGrep. We commit to master, deploy from head, no branches, and all branching is done in code, essentially. So we have feature flags. So instead of having branches that are very, very hard to deal with when you have hundreds of developers, everything is in one code tree and we can turn on and off features via feature flags. That also means we move fast. We push 30, 40, 50 times a day, new code to production, which means that we mess up. So having blameless postmortems is essential so we don't all yell at each other. Um, all the things that we've written to make this work are on GitHub. You can go grab them. Finally, Gearman. If you're using Gearman, you have to check out Driveshaft. In order to manage Gearman workers, the thing people have been using up until now is called Gearman Manager, which is a PHP script. It's a daemon that's sitting there and trying to do things that PHP really shouldn't do. So this is a C++ Gearman worker manager that works extremely well. Um, so it manages pools of workers, registers the jobs with the Gearman daemon, and all the jobs, all the actual workers are being hit. You, you hit a, a, an HTTP or an HTTPS endpoint, and that does the, the work and then reports the results back. 
you can configure it like this. JSON file, you configure your various pools and the types of jobs that they can do with the endpoints to hit. Last thing, I know I'm a minute over, but um, test your applications very, very easy. I have a Vagrant box, which is my full development environment that you can basically just clone and you can have my development environment. If you prefer Docker, Zend has provided a Docker nightly build, which is cool actually. So every night at 5 a.m. Central, I don't know which time zone, but at some point every day they, they build a new one. So it's always up to date. Mine you can do like this, git clone, um, Vagrant SSH, and you have my whole development environment. Inside that you will find many, many versions of PHP. Switching versions, you just type new PHP in the version you want. Especially for building extensions and checking extensions across multiple versions of PHP, this is extremely handy. You can also rebuild PHP anytime. Make PHP 7, we'll grab the latest code and build it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, I, we don't have time for questions, I don't think, but there's a Q&A later on. What time? Do we know? Uh, at 5 p.m., I think. 5 p.m.? Yeah. So 5 p.m., a bunch of us will be up here, so if you have questions, you can either find me or hold them until tonight, and we'll answer them then. Thanks again.